Okay, we are ready to start again. If you can just take a seat. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Brian Dietrich. He's one of our senior fellows in medical oncology. He's um, been with, uh, with us in our urologic program now for more than a year. And I'm really pleased to say that Brian will be starting his um, job next year. Take, I'm passing over the baton to Brian to help take care of our urologic oncology patients at the VA. So he's going to be talking on um, the overview of medical therapy for patients with kidney cancer. In my introduction slide, I told you that the last decade has really um, evolved with therapies for kidney cancer. So Brian is going to briefly touch on the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which is the bulk of treatments that we use for patients both when they first have diagnosis with metastatic disease and subsequent therapy, and then that will follow by an immunotherapy talk that we'll have at the next session. So thank you, Brian. All right. Thanks, Dr. Srinivas. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. So like Dr. Uh, Srinivas said, I'm Brian Dietrich. I'm one of the third-year fellows. I've been here at Stanford for five years. Uh, and lucky to have Dr. Srinivas as my mentor. So hopefully she's taught me a few things I can pass on to everyone today. So we're going to be reviewing yeah, what types of drugs we use in advanced uh, disease and kidney cancer. So I'll start just going over um, what these kind of drug classes are and then how these drugs actually work and some of the thought behind why we use these over things like conventional chemotherapy as is common practice in other disorders and cancers. And then it's a, a very evolving landscape actually on kind of which treatment options are the best. And I'll go through kind of some of how the risk stratification um, that we create for patients when they're first diagnosed and how that plays a role in how we think about what the best first treatment option is and then which treatment options we may use sequ uh, sequentially um, throughout their treatment course. And then each of these treatments has some anticipated side effects that um, our patients go through and I'll review at least kind of an overview on how um, or which side effects are most commonly observed uh, in each of these classes. So in 2017, the three largest groups of, of therapeutics that we have is the first are these VEGF inhibitors, which are essentially blood vessel blocking drugs. And we have a number of these that have been approved through the FDA um, with some of the most recent ones, cabozantinib and lenvatinib um, in the last few years. And some of the earlier ones with Sutent um, or Sunitinib um, yeah, back at least within the last 10 to 15 years, this landscape has been evolving. Um, the rest of the talk will focus on these mTOR inhibitors that still have a role and are particularly uh, kind of highlights when we may consider choosing this, uh, uh, particularly in the first line setting with Tempsirolimus based on some of these risk stratifications that we do. And then I'll briefly go over some of the immune therapies and how this is um, kind of changing the landscape of what we would consider for first line therapy. Um, and then there'll be a whole talk dedicated to those. So how do these drugs work? So I had mentioned the VEGF inhibitors work by blocking blood vessels. So we've learned a lot more about the genomics of kidney cancer. And one of the most frequent mutations um, that occurs is um, in this protein called VHL or von Hippel-Lindau. Um, that we see in over half of advanced kidney cancers when we do sequencing um, of our tumors. So in the normal protein, it actually works to break down or destroy some of these transcription factors um, called HIF, which um, um, when present, they actually increase expression of another molecule called VEGF. So VEGF works basically by creating blood vessels. Um, so if we think of a cancer cell, these kind of start off as small tumors, and normally they're able to get their kind of nutrients, their oxygen, um, from the surrounding blood vessels. But as these tumor cells start to get larger, they have a higher need um, for access in order to pull in more nutrients and supplies in order to, to survive. So one of the things 
um, that happens is they upregulate these transcription factors or these HIF factors, and this ends up leading to higher levels of this VEGF that essentially creates additional blood supply that the cancer feeds on. So one of the main targets is all of this class of medications that work on receptors that end up blocking the activity of this VEGF molecule. And that's where uh, basically by killing off the blood supply, the tumor can't grow and survive and we take away one of the survival advantages to the disease. So over here on the right of this slide um, is kind of this next group or these mTOR inhibitors. So these work basically through a signaling pathway. So all of our cells basically work by responding to signals from the outside environment or signals from outside the cancer cell. So these can set down cascades that basically end up sending signals to the center or the nucleus of the cancer cell in order to basically tell these cells to divide, to survive. So. Um, there's all these complicated proteins that result in this interaction. So two drugs that we actually use, avirolimus and tempsirolimus, yeah, block part of this signaling that gives these cells their survival advantage. And the last group of drugs that we use are these newest immune therapies, which are the new kids on the block. So we've known for a long time in kidney cancer that this is a very immune responsive disease, and this goes back to some of the earlier trials that Dr. Shaw will be talking about, um, where we used to use high doses of, of cytokines in order to treat kidney cancer and even had durable responses in a number of patients. So um, we all have an immune system that's kind of floating around and um, we go through a process um, basically called tolerance as our immune system develops, where our body recognizes us as us and anything else as foreign. So cancer cells, by definition, they're not our tissue. It's a foreign molecule that's kind of in our bodies. So one of the ways that these tumor cells kind of evade yeah, our own recognition of, of our immune system is through this interaction of a group of molecules and probably the most well-known are these PD-1, PD-L1 molecules. And a lot of you may have seen commercials for a lot of these new therapeutics that try to exploit this pathway. So with this, um, if there's interaction between PD-L1 on a cancer cell and PD-1, which is on one of our immune cells called a T cell, this basically downregulates the immune system or basically masks our immune system um, from being able to see cancer as it was designed to do. So the, we take advantage of this by giving an antibody that blocks that signal, so then the immune system can actually go in and attack cancers. And that's been the more cutting edge and more exciting um, treatment options that's come along in the last few years and it is, is used not only in kidney cancer, uh, but has approval in a number of malignancies. So before I move any further, I'm just gonna go over a few basic definitions um, of, of just some terms that we use in advanced disease. So I know our surgical colleagues had already talked about nephrectomy, which is the surgical remover, removal of the kidney that contains the tumor. And there's a role even in the metastatic setting where we'll consider actually taking out the tumor, um, even in patients that have disease that has already left the kidney and gone to other locations. Um, yeah, in certain patients, we'll also consider removing one of those kind of tumor seeds that's already in another organ, which is something we call a metastatectomy. Um, and that's, yeah, something that can be considered, particularly if we're doing scans and we see one kind of tricky spot that's, yeah, might be growing, but we see no other areas. Sometimes we'll talk to our, our surgeons to see, can we consider actually removing one single metastatic site um, um, if everything else on the scan looks okay. Um, something that we call adjuvant therapy that I'll just briefly touch on today, this is when we would give a systemic therapy after a surgery, um, and there's been some studies that have looked at some of these drugs in kidney cancer. And then, yeah, the term metastatic is um, basically equivalent to what we would say is stage four disease. So this is when seeds of the cancer have already left the kidney and have ended up in other locations like the bone, the lung, brain, lymph nodes, essentially anywhere in the body. 
and then particularly, we can't talk about oncology without looking at a lot of our clinical trials that drive the recommendations for the treatments that we have. So kind of the best trials that we have are what we call these randomized trials. And this is basically where patients are, are randomized to one or another arm or one of several arms on a study. Um, the randomization is to try to kind of separate all patient factors evenly between groups. Yeah, so we're really looking mostly at the disease entity um, and have basically equal patient populations in each. And then each of these clinical trials occurs on different phases. So you may have heard of, yeah, these phase one, two, and three. Phase one um, studies, yeah, classically are answering the question, what's the best dose of the drug that prevents a lot of side effects? And then these move into what we'd call a phase two uh, study, which is looking, is there actually efficacy or does these treatments actually work within a particular disease where we're trying to answer a question? And then the largest um, are the phase three studies, which are trying to validate that question and kind of actually come up with a new standard frequently by comparing it to a current standard that's in practice. So treatment of the metastatic disease, this is a common scan that we see in our patients when they come to our urologic oncology clinic. Um, they'll have a scan that shows yeah, frequently a large tumor, as you can see here in the left kidney, and then they'll have areas yeah, elsewhere on their CT scan or PET scan um, that end up having a biopsy that shows, yeah, basically this is a common finding of what we call clear cell kidney cancer that would confirm metastatic disease in this patient. So the landscape has kind of changed over the last 15 years or so. And this is all of the drugs that we have available to treat advanced kidney cancer. And as you can imagine, when we have all of these treatment options, then it becomes the question on which of these treatment options is the best to, to recommend for our patients. So these go back to 2005 when the first of these small molecules, these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or these blood vessel blocking drugs were approved, all the way to yeah, even last year in 2016 when we're still finding ways to exploit these blood vessel blockers um, through therapeutic options. So which drugs are the best uh, to give first, or which do we consider for our first line or our upfront treatment? So uh, this is kind of a, a table that shows all of these drugs and how we kind of sort, or, sort of triage them into our, our clinics. So the first thing that, that I frequently do is actually just think about what's the risk um, um, when we see a new diagnosed patient. So there's a few, um, uh, basically algorithms that we can actually plug numbers into. This is one example from um, the group over at Memorial Sloan Kettering where you can actually look at a few um, prognostic factors of a patient's disease when they're first diagnosed. So in this they look at basically uh, yeah, how long it takes in order to start a first systemic treatment, uh, what are some of the lab values on the blood work looking at a marker of hemoglobin, of calcium, another protein that's commonly seen in cells um, called LDH, and then just the physical performance status or how well a patient looks. Um, so there's different variants of these prognostic scales that we look at, and they can be useful in kind of predicting how aggressive we think a disease is just from the get-go, and do we think that based on some of these models, a patient is um, statistically more likely to have a worse outcome um, compared to if these factors weren't present. And this is just one. There's many other models that will change some of these um, numbers. Um, um, one that actually substitutes LDH to look at some other blood cell counts in your white blood cells and platelets. Um, but this is just an example on how we might stratify um, a person that can be useful, one, for how we determine treatment options, as well as if we're thinking about clinical trials in the upfront setting. Um, we're looking more frequently at using risk as part of that consideration. So a few questions uh, to consider actually when we're choosing the first line drug. One, um, and this is something actually we tend to bring up in patients that I think can cause a lot of anxiety actually as a side effect is, do we actually have to start a treatment even in the advanced disease right away? Do we have a little bit of time and can some patients actually safely be watched off of any treatment? Uh, 
another consideration is um, with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, I had showed this slide that there's many different options. So which one of these is the best, and is there actually an optimal TKI to use first over the others? And then currently in 2017, while we're coming out with all these new drugs, these new immune therapies, is there still a role for some of these older mTOR inhibitors um, for the frontline treatment? So this is an article that was actually published a little over a year ago in one of our oncology journals, The Lancet. Um, and this is from yeah, Brian Reaney, who yeah, practices out of my old stomping ground in uh, the Cleveland area, looking at basically if we take patients that have asymptomatic disease, meaning they were diagnosed based on a scan that was either done for surveillance or another indication, and then um, had confirmation of metastatic disease, if we actually watch them um, before doing treatment, kind of what's the typical trajectory um, on how long they would actually need um, uh, or could be watched before treatment would be indicated. So when we talk asymptomatic, these are patients that basically walk into clinic and look extremely well. So some patients with advanced disease will have either pain symptoms, they can have tumor that's blocking um, structures that can be causing problems, um, they could have symptoms as far as cough if, or other um, shortness of breath if the, the disease is in the lung. So these are patients that wouldn't need treatment for any other reason. Um, so what they did, is, um, did on this study is basically yeah, no treatment was started, and they did repeat scans at set intervals, usually about every three months, just to see how fast these tumors are growing, knowing that kidney cancer in general tends to be one of the slower growing cancers. So can we actually, if we only have a one centimeter tumor spot, um, if that's going to be slowly growing over a long period of time, can we avoid some of the initial toxicities of treatment, knowing that compared to when we're looking at earlier stages, um, where we're trying to cure the disease, all of our treatment options are, are mostly trying to control. So if we can get a little bit more time just by watching and avoiding the treatment side effects until we really need them um, is one of the considerations of this study. So this is what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve um, that we'll be seeing a lot of throughout the rest of the talks through the day, which basically plots patients on a clinical trial. So everybody starts here at 100%, and then whenever an event happens on study, uh, that causes basically yeah, a drop off on the curve. So an event can be depending on what the endpoint we're looking at. So if we're talking about um, progression-free survival is a common um, endpoint that we look at that's looking at how long does it take for growth of the cancer to be seen. Overall survival is another endpoint that we look at, meaning um, how long until there's actually a death of a patient on a clinical trial. So these two curves are looking, basically breaking down at these favorable versus unfavorable groups, looking at some of those prognostic models that I had mentioned. So clearly if you have more unfavorable features, it takes less time before we would actually need to require a treatment if we're just doing surveillance. So on average, yeah, those patients, it took about eight months before the clinician and the patient felt there was some indication to start therapy while on observation, versus it could be actually much longer um, in the low risk group or the favorable group, um, sometimes more towards the two years. So this is something that particularly if we look at a scan in a patient that's completely asymptomatic, we may consider yeah, even just watching and seeing where we're at in another three months um, to kind of see um, um, yeah, is there actually significant growth um, of disease just to kind of buy a little bit more time and avoid some of the toxicities of our treatments for a little while longer. So getting to the treatments, um, I'll talk about, um, at least review the clinical trials on probably the two most common um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we use. The first is sunitinib or sutent, and then I'll review um, votrient or um, pizopinib. So all of these target not just VEGF um, or the VEGF receptor, which is these blood vessel blocking drugs, but they have a few other off targets um, as well. So the dose that was approved through the FDA is this 50 milligrams once a day on this four week on, two week off schedule. Although when we actually use this in practice, um, we find a lot of patients actually have a harder time with this um, 
administration. And there's actually good data on an alternative um, dosing schedule where we give the, the drug for two weeks on, one week off. Um, and at least from everything that we know about using it in that fashion, it's felt to be equivalent. Um, so a lot of oncologists, both here um, and throughout the country, yeah, may do a different yeah, dosing administration. Um, and we feel that that is a, um, equivalent to what um, was initially proved um, in 2006. So this is looking at the Kaplan-Meier curve from the initial um, SUTENT study when they were comparing it to basically the only standard that we had available at the time, uh, which is interferon. So kind of a rule of thumb when you're looking at these Kaplan-Meier curves, if you're sitting in the back of the room and you can put your thumb yeah, in between the curves, that's usually a positive study and tells us that there's probably a good treatment effect between those. So you can see when we compared it to our one of our older treatments, interferon, clearly um, patients that took SUTENT ended up having control of their disease for a lot longer. And then if you actually look at what the responses are, um, when we kind of grade these, we actually take measurements on the CT scans on patients that are coming back. So anybody that's either been on a cl uh, clinical trial or known somebody that has been on a clinical trial knows they get scans fairly frequently, um, sometimes even more often than we would generally do. And that's to take measurements to kind of assess what the response is. So um, part of those responses are what we call these complete response, and that would be when we actually would see no evidence of cancer on a scan. And then more commonly, at least with these drugs, we see at least some reduction or what we call partial response is what they're looking at. And with SUTENT, clearly had more of a, a response um, compared to the, yeah, the older treatment with interferon. And then this is the follow-up where they looked at survival. Yeah, the curves, although not as far apart, um, you can see there's definitely separation compared to the old standard with SUTENT um, compared to interferon. So in comparison, another yeah, tyrosine kinase inhibitor is Votriant or Pizopinib. So this is another blood vessel blocking drug that inhibits all these VEGF receptors, um, as we had talked about. And generally, the starting dose of this um, would be um, several pills a day or 800 milligrams. And the drug actually, you can have higher absorption actually if it's taken with food. So a lot of these drugs we end up taking separate from meals for that reason. And uh, this was actually approved in October of 2009 based on improvement in progression-free or taking a longer time for your cancer to grow um, compared to placebo. And this is you know, a little bit of a fuzzy Kaplan-Meier looking at that, but compared to basically a placebo or a sugar pill, um, yeah, use of pizopinib um, led to significant yeah, tumor control for a much longer period of time. Um, and led to approval of this um, drug as a, a treatment option. So these are our two most commonly used tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, so yeah, patients would come into clinic and it's always kind of a toss up on which drug uh, we would pick and raise the question, is one better than another? So this is the COMPARES study that actually enrolled a large number of patients, over 1,000, randomizing them to receive either SUTENT or Pizopinib on this uh, phase three clinical trial. Um, so the SUTENT schedule ended up being that kind of approved four week on, two week off, rather than one of the other dosing uh, recommendations. And what we had um, learned from this study is that the two drugs are essentially equivalent to each other. So this on the left is looking at progression-free survival or how long it takes the tumor to grow. And you can appreciate these curves overlap, meaning um, there's really no difference between SUTENT versus Votriant as far as um, control. They both seem to work, um, or one is not worse than the other. And this is actually overall survival or chances of dying um, on either of the treatment arm. And again, they're very similar between those. Uh, one thing that they did notice is they actually gave patients just satisfaction scores and quality of life assessments, meaning did one of these treatments tend to cause more side effects than the other? 
Um, so one thing that, that was noted is that, yeah, there's definitely differences in some of the side effects between the two. So SUTENT overall tend to cause a little bit more fatigue or decreased energy. Um, again, this is on, yeah, that four week on, two week off um, regimen. So definitely we can see some modification of those side effects with a different um, administration regimen. And then pizopinib yeah, can cause some other side effects, uh, but overall patients on the study seem to prefer tolerate pizopinib a little bit better, um, but there's different ways that we can give su um, um as well. Yes? Uh, Votrient or pizopinib, based on the, the study, when they were just asking patients which of these they had done better. And there was another study where they actually had given both drugs. Uh, basically, they give, um, gave one group pizopinib first, and then sutent, and then switched, and then just actually asked them which one they preferred. And pizopinib was, tended to be preferred even on that study. Um, but again, sutent, like I said, can be given a little bit differently, so um, that can take away some of that, uh, more of the side effects that sutent had. So moving on to um, um, Toracel or Tempsirolimus, this is the, um, one of those mTOR inhibitors or one of those drugs that interferes with that signaling pathway um, that causes cell growth and um, division. So. Um, this is one of the only IV drugs, I think the only IV drug that we use in, um, yeah, out of these agents um, and has been available based, uh, basically since 2007 based on a study comparing it to one of our old standards, Interferon. So um, this got approval basically um, looking at patients with the worst risk features. So basically those, um, those risk stratifications, this would be patients that we would predict would have worse outcomes. And they looked basically comparing the old standard of interferon to using um, this mTOR inhibitor, Tempsirolimus alone, to the combination of them, looking at survival as the primary endpoint. So this is the Kaplan-Meier curve, um, looking at each of those arms, and you might be able to appreciate, sorry, the figure's a little bit fuzzy, that this green line is the Tempsirolimus arm, um, and that one was, uh, basically showed a longer survival compared to either the combination or using the old standard interferon alone. So based on this, this led to FDA approval, and this is one that, though it's tending to fall more out of favor as new therapeutics are coming along, is still a consideration for this poor risk group based on those initial parameters. So one of the newer kids on the block, at least within the tyrosine kinase family, is cabozantinib. So this is a small molecule that hits not only VEGF, but some other um, targets as well, uh, which can cause a little bit more side effects um, than some of the other kind of more direct VEGF inhibitors. So this was improved um, in March of last year for patients that had basically disease growth uh, after being treated with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, and this is basically uh, the phase two study that compared yeah, this drug, cabozantinib, to one of the oral forms of the mTOR inhibitors, which was um, kind of one of our go-to drugs then for second-line treatment before we had a lot of these immune, uh, immune therapies. So cabozantinib basically led to longer control um, of the disease compared to the other oral mTOR inhibitors. So this raised the question is, yeah, so this has a few other offset targets. Can we actually move this up earlier? And this is a phase two study called Cabosun where they actually tried to answer that question by comparing cabozantinib to sutent, um, looking at disease control or progression-free survival as the, the end point. And they were looking at basically patients with worse risk. So on those risk models, looking at intermediate and poor risk with about 80% being intermediate risk and 20% being poor risk uh, on this study. So Cabosun kind of confirmed that definitely there is some improved disease control with Cabozantinib as compared to Sutent and response rates were also a little bit more. Um, um, there were a few patients that actually had dropped off the sunitinib arm, um, maybe a few more than the cabo, um, which raises the question, yeah, is there a, a better schedule that could make uh, sutent a little bit more tolerated? But at least uh, based on the, the data that we have, there appears there may be some 
um, some role for cabozantinib in the first-line setting, um, especially in those intermediate and poor risk group patients. Um, although this, as of uh, today, is still approved only for the second-line treatment or in patients that have progressed after a prior VEGF. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so this Kaplan-Meier curve is looking at what we call progression-free survival. So each of those lines is an event where, on study, the patient would have a scan that showed some tumor growth or progression. So, yeah, that's when, um, that's what each of those mash, um, hashtags mean, versus some of the other curves sometimes we'll look at overall survival, which would be a patient death that would kind of mark those. So it depends on kind of what the axis on the curve is looking at. So, yeah, those are kind of the treatments we've been using in the past years, and now more recently we've been using immune therapy drugs and um, have had those available for the last uh, two years or so um, in patients that had disease progression on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And this was a press release actually from September of last month looking at combinations of immune therapies for patients that have had um, no prior treatment, or looking at this in the first line setting. So I had started this talk saying that kind of the treatments we choose are evolving. So this is kind of an exciting update that was presented just at one of our European oncology conferences in September. Um, so we're anticipating that there's likely to, going to be a, an updated FDA approval for this that will kind of adjust which treatments we think about. Uh, um, and can actually add this as one of those options going forward. And Sumit will likely be talking more about this in his talk. So just a quick slide on treatment effects um, while I'm finishing up. Um, so each of these drugs yeah, has a unique kind of class of side effects. Um, anybody that's seen patients on these tyrosine kinase inhibitors probably knows that the blood pressure is one of the more common effects that we need, and our patients come to clinic actually with diaries monitoring their blood pressure. Um, definitely we can see other changes, particularly in the skin and in hair, particularly Votriant can cause some whitening of the hair. Um, and then this hand-foot syndrome is another common um, side effect that we see um, with any of these TKIs. Um, and then we do frequent, frequent monitoring of their blood work as well, just looking for abnormalities in liver function tests and any other um, changes in blood counts that would be concerning. Uh, with the mTOR inhibitors, um, probably some of the more unique side effects is this pulmonary effect that we can see. And depending on the studies, yeah, somewhere between 1 and 5% of patients may have what we call a pneumonitis, which is just inflammation in the lung. Um, uh, that can frequently just start presenting with cough or shortness of breath. So that's something that um, we pay attention to um, that may require an adjustment in treatment and sometimes even stopping it and needing to treat with steroids if there's a lot of inflammation um, to bring that down. And then Sumit will be talking more about the side effects of yeah, these immune type therapies, which um, um, fatigue is probably the most common that we see, but then since we're taking the breaks off the immune system, we can get some of these immune reactions where our immune system can attack essentially any part of the body, um, almost like an autoimmune type disorder. Um, so he'll be going into that more details during his talk. So in summary, yeah, our treatments uh, consist of three large classes of drugs, the blood vessel blocking VEGF inhibitors, the mTOR inhibitors that work on um, this cell proliferation and by slowing down that cell signaling, and then these newer immune therapy drugs. Uh, Pizopinib and Sutent, as of today, still remain first-line treatment options, although that landscape is, is continuing to change as more drugs are studied and become available, especially in combinations. Uh, particularly for the poor risk group, um, Tempsirolimus is still a consideration for upfront treatment. Again, though, tending to fall out of favor here. And then I had mentioned that cabozantinib, there's some data on use of that as kind of a first line treatment option, um, although we don't currently have an approval um, just yet for that. And then for any patient that's progressed after one of these initial treatments, um, treatment with either immune therapy, yeah, basically a, a different VEGF inhibitor, um, or even combinations of these with VEGF and mTOR are all reasonable options. 
and then uh, we expect that this is going to continue to evolve as more treatment options become available down the line. All right. Any questions, Ari? Thanks. So. Ah. so you talked a little bit about risk factors, and you talked mm -hmm. about the Sloan-Kettering score. Is that the way you assess risk factors, or can you say a little more about how you define good intermediate Yeah, so there's a few different algorithms that we look at. I just put the Sloan-Kettering up as an example, um, and it's all based on yeah, some of those presenting variables. So um, a lot of those are lab abnormalities. Um, all of them tend to include how long it takes from diagnosis to when treatment is started. Um, so all of those just give us a little bit of sense on um, do we think that a patient is more likely to have a worse outcome earlier um, that can be suggested by some of those risk models. Mm -hmm. When you say approval, are you talking FDA approval? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so the FDA, they review all of these large clinical trials and then determine based on that proven efficacy um, if they'll give approval for the drug based on the, you know, how well the drug works and what the safety profile of it is. Yes. To, to what extent does the Furman grade determine treatment options? Yeah, so at least as far as grade, um, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily impact, yeah, which treatment that we think. It does play a role kind of in the risk of the disease itself. Um, uh, but necessarily, we wouldn't choose one treatment, yeah, just purely based on the grade. There's um, some data looking at, like, the histologic subtypes that Dr. Srinivas had talked about. Particularly, there's some data looking at chromophobe. Um, and there's some phase two studies that may suggest possibly using mTORs may have a little bit of a signal or more benefit um, compared to VEGF inhibitors. Um, so we take all of that in consideration, yeah, when we're doing those initial evaluations. Do you know if there's going to be a discussion about um, the efficacy of radiation versus immunotherapy? Yeah, I don't think we have a schedule We didn't have radiation, uh, radiation as one of our uh, topics for today, but I can speak to it a little bit. We don't use radiation. We think about radiation more like surgery. It's really a local treatment. So if there's any one particular area that's bothersome, radiation is used. So typically it's used for either bone disease that may be painful, um, it's used, to, again, you know, as an individual site, but really when we think about systemic treatments, when there are multiple sites involved, radiation might not be an appropriate treatment. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Most of them, the medicine lasted like somewhere around eight to 10 months, and then you started noticing a dip. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that would be about an yeah, average yeah, expected time span, which is why it's important that yeah, we have new treatment options and expanding treatment options, because eventually all of these treatments yeah, yeah, have a set failure rate. So um, yeah, we're trying to learn not only uh, other therapeutic targets, but then can we combine these to get further yeah, efficacy? And then uh, depending on how the drug works, if someone has a lot of cancer compared to someone who just a little bit, um, if the side effects are more intense or not as bad or? Yeah, the burden of the disease shouldn't really affect the side effects on the drugs. Um, um, but kind of depending, particularly sometimes we can see some immune flare. So if there's a lot of disease burden, then particularly that's something that we'll pay attention to. Um, um, which has kind of been a more unique phenomenon we've seen with some of these newer therapeutic drugs. Um, as opposed to the VEGF, we generally, some of the older oral drugs, we don't see that same type of flare um, sometimes with those. All right. Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you all for your questions. We are really glad that you're being engaged. <laughs>